welcome. It's the FIH Hockey Women's World Cup show, and it's the first uh, the first show in a series that we're uh, where we're going to be talking about this fabulous event that's going to be taking place in Terrassa and Amstelveen. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined on the first show um, by Jana Mollevillen from uh, Germany. Hi, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really, really good. Uh, we're also expecting uh, Jill Boone from Belgium to join us. Um, she's actually just driving from training to uh, to find a suitable point. So we'll be joined by her as well. And we've got Dan Strange, uh, hockey commentator, superb and extraordinaire. Hi, Dan. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Yep, really good. So um, I'm going to come to you first, Jana, just because you've got so much experience at World Cup hockey. Um, talk to me a little bit about what this particular World Cup, what sort of challenges this World Cup is going to throw to the players, in particular, the fact it's split over two venues? Yeah, it's an interesting one because I think in general, World Cups are a massive challenge because it's the, it's the World Cup, right? It's not Europeans, it's not the Pro League of Test matches. So um, there's a massive performance element in there. And then on top of that, you're in two different places and only you get together if you make the, make the finalists. So it would be interesting to see how the atmospheres are in different places, how, how teams show up when they actually do have to travel at some point. Um, yeah, so it, it, I think it's the fir- world's first of this kind of setup. So uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a great event. Um, but the teams, you know, they've arrived in their venues, they, they're doing their preparations. Um, Jill, you've joined us. Hi, Jill, how are you? We hopefully got Jill in just a second. Uh, while Jill's just getting herself sorted, um, Jana, the, the teams, um, what are they going to be doing in these couple of days before uh, the action starts? You know, what, what's the sort of the last minute preps that they're going to be doing? Yeah, typically it, it depends on where you come from, right? The ones that have to travel overseas, they come earlier to, to just, and, you know, get used to the jet lag and uh, to, to the climate as well. Obviously the European teams have got it a bit easier. They try to um, spend a lot, a lot of time on the pitch um, to, to get used to it because it's, every pitch is different, even though everyone says it's the same first surface, it's just different. And you want to feel, in the first game, you want to feel like home and not, you know, it's a new pitch, a new environment. And again, it's it's interesting the last few days, some people, some some teams just really, have intense sessions to get into that kind of intensity a game will have. Some have intense sessions and then just like go down a little bit and have a few days off, you know, depending on your rhythm as well, because during the World Cup, some teams will have back-to-back games, a gap, another game, and someone will have a gap every now and then. So it's, I think, very, very different in terms of the individual plan, but overall, they just try to get a few test matches in or training matches um, and just get a good feeling with stick and ball and you'll be ready for the first game. Yeah, I mean, Jill, um, just sort of Belgium, yes. it, taking them as a, and hi, welcome to the show, taking hi. Belgium as a specific example, what do you expect the team will be doing in these next couple of days? Because, I mean, it's a fairly local tournament for them, isn't it? Um, and they've had all this preparation through Pro League. So are they likely to have a few down days before they, uh, before they really get into it? Uh, well, from what I've seen and how hard they were training, I don't think so. I think they're ready. And obviously, they, we, a World Cup is always full of surprise. And we've seen it last time with Ireland, for example, reaching the final. And I think Belgium could be one of the big surprises from, uh, from, this, uh, from this World Cup. Yeah, I think we've, we've sort of seen them play in the Pro League. We, we know that's very much the case. Um, Dan, you've, you've sort of been getting to know the teams over the course of the entire Pro League. Um, heading into this tournament, what do you, th- you know, what, what are your, imp- your initial impressions in terms of what the team's going to be doing? Which teams do you think are looking really, really sharp as we go, as we go into, the, uh, into the tournament? I've said it once and I'll say it for the hundredth time. I think Argentina, for me, looked like the best team going in. <laughs> you can never discount the Netherlands in any way, shape, shape or form. And I'm not before anyone sort of starts saying, oh, you know, why is he writing them off? I th- I think what stood out for me with the Netherlands this season is, yes, they've played different squads and they've got massive strength in depth, but they haven't necessarily blown teams away like we've seen sort of in the last probably seven years, well, since they won in The Hague in 2014 at least. That, for me, is, is sort of the question mark for them, or that's where they become, you know, the, the, the Argentinians drew with them twice in the Pro League. Other teams ran them close. I think, I think Belgium ran them close in the opening match. So, although they've mixed and matched their squad a lot, I think Argentina and the Netherlands are the two top of the tree. Below that, it's going all ways. I've, I've been looking at the sort of makeup of the draw and loads of teams can beat each other within this World Cup, which is going to make it fascinating. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, there are definitely some fascinating, but if we, in fact, if we go to the pools and have a look at those fascinating pools, if we have a look at pool A to start with, um, Jana, you're going to have an opinion on this one because we've got Chile with a world ranking of 17, um, Ireland, who we know have form at this tournament, they're on a world ranking of 12. Then we've got Germany, um, who have been playing some exceptional hockey um, over, the, over the past few weeks and months. And then, of course, we've got the Netherlands. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? It's an interesting pool. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm German and might be biased, but I feel like obviously Germany and, and Holland are the, the top two candidates in there. But again, as, as Jill said, they're always surprises and all, all of those three games will be very tough for all of them. Um, Chile, I think it's, it's amazing that they qualified for the World Cup. So it will be, you know, they have they will be full of energy and, you know, give it their all. And Ireland is, is always a tough opponent to, to beat, right? So they and they've come really close to the, yeah, the top teams in the world. Um, Germany Holland is a classic game, which it's always in, in just, in, in an interesting one. But all of those teams, I think, they have, have had massive changes. So the Germans, whilst the team, the squad is actually quite similar to the Olympic squad from last year, they've got a new coach and a whole new coaching staff. So again, and and also throughout this year, because of the Bundesliga and the Pro League, they've maybe played two, three games in the World Cup squad lineup. And before that, it was always you know testing new players, trying to get younger ones in. So it would be interesting if. They had enough time together. Well, it's mm. the Dutch, obviously. Um, yeah, they always have, they can train during the week together because they live so close. Um, again, new coach, new setup, some new players, some retired after the Olympics. And it will be t- interesting to see how they actually perform under pressure when it counts in front of their home crowd as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the Netherlands coach, uh, you know very well, Jamie Mulders. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword for Jamie, isn't it? Because he's he's got a world-class team that um, everybody is sort of expecting to do really, really well. So, you know, he could be the coach who just guides them to victory, or he could be the coach who sees them fail. Which would be which would be you know how will he how will he handle that sort of pressure? Because it's quite a unique position for a coach to be in, isn't it? Yeah, it's probably one of one of the hardest positions to be in as a coach because you can have all the success, but if you don't succeed and everyone expects it of you, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's a big disappointment. But Jummy is quite a good coach for that team because he sees himself more as a facilitator and he's there to listen and to enable them instead of you know pushing something on them. So it's it's down to the team. And to be honest, I think it's always been down to the team for the Dutch team in the last years. Come kind of come away from this dictator style as coach to more like. You know, the team, they're smart enough. They've got enough experience to, to decide what they want to play and how they want to play. And he's just there to enable them to, like, help them fly, really. Yeah. Um, just before we move out of that pool, because we do need to move on to the other pools. But, Dan, um, Germany, uh, I thought, were superb um, in their last Pro League match. And the person, obviously, who stuck out a mile was Pierre Martins. Um, just your thoughts very, very quickly on that, on that final sort of German performance. Are they peaking at exactly the right time, in your opinion? I don't think they peaked. Oh. I don't think they peaked. I, I don't think that Germany have peaked yet and I want to see them string together 60 minutes because I think that's where I, I've actually got them down not to beat the Netherlands on Sunday. But in my wall chart, because I'm a kid of the 1990 World Cup in Italy back in the day, I've got them in the final. Now, <laughs> call me mad. I've even I've heard predictions Belgium are going to make the final from a very, very well-respected commentator. So, as we said, it's open. I, I don't think they've quite peaked Germany. I think there's... Um, there's space for improvement from them in terms of putting it together for the whole time, as I said. And they're always they're always cool in shootouts. So when you get to knockout, you know, mm-hmm. Germany, I know it's a bit of a stereotype, but being English, being British, we kind of, you know, we lot, lots of years of hurt against Germany in shootouts. We know that when Germany step up into a shootout, they tend to get it done. And yeah. and actually, like the, what we say about German teams is that they're tournament teams so they, they were never peak in the first few games they kind of build up and learn through, along the way but of course you have to you know peak at some point and, and that's the question will they get together as a team quickly enough to perform when it really matters um they've got the nerves hopefully but it's in the end to just really you know bring it down to put yeah to performance when it counts yeah well wait and see do Germany peak at the right time and um, moving on to pool B um, now Jill this is a tricky pull to call I mean we've got China uh new coach they've been building every single game we've got England who seem to have been building forever uh we've got India who have really really been outstanding in the pro league and have shown a huge amount of talent and we've got New Zealand who nobody's seen what is th- <laughs> what are your thoughts on that pool I think it's it's really complicated and, uh, and also in, the, in in the pro league we've seen a couple of games of China under Alison Hennen and 
even there the team is changing a bit and, and we, we never know in India too. So there are teams that we didn't see for the last two year, three year, two years and a half almost. So it's gonna be really complicated. And if I if well we couldn't even bet on, on the the two first ones uh, after after the pool. So it's gonna be interesting also on how they perform in the tournament, like like uh, Yana said, like Germany is a in a, is a, is a team that performs in a tournament, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see how well China or India, for example, are going to perform like one, two, or three games in a row, yeah. and how New Zealand is coming back after also with a couple of experienced players that are that that retired recently, and so rebuilding where no one no one can see you, where no one has any idea of what you're doing, could be also a big advantage and kind of a surprise element that can help them during the tournament. Yeah, because I, I think one of the things that's astonished us throughout the Pro League has been the um, the incredible nature of the 3D skills that teams are, are, are using at the moment. And speaking to Shane McAleese, who's one of the assistant coaches, he said that's something that New Zealand are going to have to get used to very, very quickly. But as you say, they could have been doing all of their own things and we know absolutely nothing about it. Dan, what's your take on that, Paul? You know, as a staunch England, England man, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I was a junior Welsh player, so I have to be careful what I say, otherwise my mum won't talk to me. But I, my view with New Zealand, and I covered them at the Olympics when they got knocked out to the Netherlands, I thought they were slightly on a downward curve then. Obviously, Stacey stepped away. She was one of the linchpins for them. I can't see how you don't play sort of any major, I know they played Australia, but any major international hockey from Olympics to a World Cup and expect to turn up. So for me, and I'm, I'm happy to sort of, you know, not sit on the fence on things because that's the whole point. I don't think New Zealand make out the group. I think England, England, China and India can all beat each other. The danger for the three of them is if they do beat each other because they might knock one of them out by the fact New Zealand, depending on how they go. China and India, you have to sort of, you, you can't look at the form from the Asian Asia Cup earlier in Muscat this year, 7-1. India, I can't see India beating China 7-1. In, uh, China's goalkeeper, Liu, is fantastic. Um, but equally, India are very good and uh, Yannick has got them playing the hockey they want. England are very unpredictable at the moment. Um, and I think they know that as well. But the beauty of that, as uh, Yana just said, is in a World Cup, if you get on a roll and they've got players in there that have experience of getting on roles in big competitions, they could go places. In real terms, I'm saying England, India and China to make it out of the group. I don't know in what order and please, Kiwis, don't have a go at me. I just, I can't see how you piece it together from Olympics to World Cup where you had a relatively disappointing Olympics to coming into World Cup and being a, a force. I can't see it. Mm. It's interesting, you know, you talk about Stacey Mickelson and she's still a big name on people's lips when they speak about the New Zealand team. But um, Jana, you know, you, you take a key player out of a squad somebody always steps in, don't they? You know, and, and it might change the dynamic of the squad, but quite often it can be a, a, a positive if, if it changes other things. Yeah, it's always a positive, like, because that change it brings something new with it. And, and if that, whether that's one person stepping up or all of them and just, you know, spreading that responsibility amongst more shoulders. Um, again, I think they've also got a new coaching staff, um, a few new players. They always come... I know I hear what Shay is saying, but I wouldn't be so worried about 3D skills because that's not their game, right? They come through fitness and through speed and through counter attacks. Um, so it's it's more like sticking to what they're really good at and believing in themselves and being less worried about everyone else and that they haven't played as much, maybe. I know they've been in Europe for quite a while, so they've had a, quite a few games probably while they were here um, and they're ready to go. And again, they've got the um, Commonwealth Games afterwards as well. So it's a big year and a big summer for them. And I'm sure they will learn quickly as a group as they go along. At least they've got that much time together. Again, Germany just comes together for a camp and goes back home, right? And they've got so much time together and that can really help as well um, to just really grow quickly. But yeah, it would be interesting. It wouldn't surprise me if they actually make it into the crossovers or, or quarterfinals. Um, but yeah, and and in and, and that point, it just comes down to mental strength and not so much about the hockey at that point anymore. At the expense of who? Who do, who do you think they'll uh, <laughs> knock out of those other well, three? Again, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing China and how Alice and Ellen can influence them to perform in the right moment. The last two games they played in the Pro League, they just lost like two games, except for the one against the younger German squad. They lost quite significantly. So it's again, how quickly can they regroup from that? And will they come like 
with fuller confidence or will they be a bit yeah disappointed by that as well but again China they change players all the time the new coming new players coming in they didn't play their whole squad so it's it's a bit yeah a bit of a surprise what really what they would be like but it might be those two maybe um fighting for the third spot yeah and and Jill I mean India they finished the you know in the disappointing fourth place in Tokyo but they would have learned so much from that experience wouldn't they that they're, they're now bringing forwards yeah and also they're building something great about um about hockey, well, women's hockey in, in, in their own country. And so they have all that that legacy that they want to bring in, 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 in their history. And I think it's always a good team. It's always a team that fights really hard and it is really technical. So it's going to be yeah, interesting to see the performing. And even, yeah, like we said, you know, against England or against China and who is going to lose points against each other. But I think India is going to play nice hockey, I think. And, and I, I wish them the best and to continue to write their history and that woman women's hockey is continue to grow so big in their in their own country and I, th- I think you said it the other day actually in a, in a previous podcast that they also look like they're thoroughly enjoying themselves and we've seen that the effect that can have with Belgian men for example you know when you're enjoying yourself yeah. you play great hockey um so team a team that's really been enjoying itself is uh, over in Pool C I know these are one of Dan's favorite teams but um, Argentina uh, who'll find themselves up against um, Spain, who are equally energetic and uh, and passionate on the pitch. And then we've got the uh, Koreans and the Canadians, who we haven't seen an awful lot of. So um, if you come to you, Dan, on that pool, I mean, Argentina, Spain, Korea, Czech, Canada, don't sit on the fence. What are your thoughts? Argentina win it. Because I I, having seen them against Spain, and I really rate Spain, as you said, and I actually think Spain could be involved in the latter stage of the competition. I, I can't see them getting past Argentina because I do think if Argentina uh, get it all together, they'll be fantastic. Korea are the one I can't really work out because they had a good Asia Cup. They obviously qualified in Muscat for this. They will be a difficult team to beat, to, to beat in a similar way to how Allison will set up China because that's kind of... They, they might not, they may not be as attacking, but they'll set their sort of stall out, make themselves difficult to break down, which in tournament hockey makes it tough. I can see them therefore beating Canada. So again, my three to qualify from this group are Argentina, Spain and Korea. But as I've said all along, like this is there to be proved wrong. And like we said in the last group, all it takes is New Zealand to actually come out and have a blast and mm. cat amongst the pigeons time. In this one, I just can't see how Canada... Um, have enough of a threat, especially for the top two for Argentina and Spain. Both of uh, my other two guests here have got lots of experience playing against, in particular, Spain and Argentina. I mean, Jill, um, Spain and Belgium have been sort of neck and neck in the rankings. They've been neck and neck in terms of who goes through to various events. What are your thoughts on Spain, having watched them for the last uh, few months? Yeah, I think it's a team that's building and working as hard as the Belgium team. Mm-hmm. And that's why there is a tournament that we win it and that there is a tournament that, that they, they, they win it, but they qualify to the Olympics, but we didn't. And they're growing and getting better. And they're also a couple of uh, more experienced players than they left out of the selection. So it's, yeah, we're going to see also how they handle the pressure to play at home yeah. uh, in front of their own crowd and, and to see how they handle that. And, and I think they, like, yeah, we, I can even see them beating Argentina in, in the group stage. Um, uh, but yeah, I think like Argentina is the, is the favorite uh, and he's also my favorite of what I've seen in, in, the, um, in the pro league and how fast and physical they are now. And if they dribble a bit less, I mean, for, for me, it's a bit too much, but I think they play also in really interesting hockey and it's, it's a team that I saw Holland str- really struggling in two games, really struggling to get out of pressure, to play their game and and so it's going to be interesting to see them in the first stage also of the tournament and hoping also that Argentina, it's always easier, I think, to to come as underdog, knowing that Holland is probably going to win it and try to beat mm-hmm. Holland. I think it's always about trying to beat Holland. And now if they come as favorite, favorite you know, they're going to have to to play the game as favorite. So we see how they, they handle the pressure too. Yeah, I mean, Jana... Th- th- Yes, Argentina, um, their full strength squad against Netherlands, their full st- um, strength squad could not be separated in the Pro League. It was uh, apart from through the shootouts in the actual 60 minutes of play, couldn't be separated. Um, as someone who has been part of a team that's tried and tried and tried to beat the Netherlands, what did Argentina do well? And what do they need to do well this time in order to uh, top the podium? 
As Jill said, they've got incredible speed and skills. Um, yeah, it's de debatable how, how much you have to draw in in what moment, but they've got a yeah incredible threat in the D. So it's it's in the end, it always comes down to effectiveness in the D because it's nice if you play um, in three quarters of the field, but what happens really and what's the outcome? And they're yeah, they've got so many amazing forwards. If any of them just touch the ball in the D, it's a, it's a big um, yeah alarm for anyone defending. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I think if I get if they get to that point, they'd be dangerous and they'll win games but then again they played India and they were really struggling and they were just throwing balls away and they couldn't receive them and couldn't you know get into their own build-up and completely lost their own way of playing they still played well and they drew them at some point but it's not if they weren't dominating as they should be if they want to be the World Cup winners and they want to be top of the world ranking so it's, it's still interesting to see that they they've got the quality and they could do it but they're not as experienced enough to like do it in every single game no matter who I'm playing so again, comes down to the performance moment and new coach as well. They, their leader, their wasn't selected with you know massive experience as well. Changing those leadership leadership structures just before tournament is this also a challenge. So yeah, again, we're really, really um, interesting to see. I think Spain as well in front of a home crowd could be a boost. It could be really motivated. They they live off emotions. It could be for some a bit intimidating, but they they've got some time to get into that throughout the group stages. And when it really matters, they've got experiences not new to play in front of their own crowd anymore. So yeah, interesting one. But actually, Argentina's got the potential to do it. Um, but will they do it with that team? Yeah, Dan Dan will know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think one of the biggest challenges will be actually when they step up against Korea because it's a team they don't know. Um, and they, you know, they, they're going to perhaps have to adapt their play a little bit against against them. And we can't write off Canada. You know, they've got they've got some very good solid players. Unfortunately, they just haven't been on the world stage, so we don't know an awful lot about them. Um, time is catching up with us, so let's let's move to Pool D, uh, where we've got the unknown um, force of Australia, but obviously led by Katrina Powell. Heaps of experience there. There's experience in the squad, although there's also a big turnover of players. We've got Jill's team. We've got Belgium there, um, who are hoping to do really well. We've got Japan. Um, who did fabulously in the Asia Cup. And we've got South Africa, who always come with a hard-working, feisty attitude. So, Dan, what do you reckon? Belgium win the pool, because they're the form team. Australia will play attacking hockey, because it's Trini Powell. Um, but as you said, Ty Turner over a place. Although, saying that, they have also got um, still got quality in there. So, you know, they've still got players that can step up and do it and have... May, may have actually been refreshed by the break, some of them. Um, in terms of Japan and South Africa, as you said, Japan had a good Asia Cup. They, I saw them a bit at the Olympics and I felt they needed to sort of make steps forward, which I think they then did make at the Asia Cup. It'll be interesting to see them again at the world stage. South Africa were described earlier to me by a former South African player as a, what was it he said, a new old team, if you know what I mean. And I sort of looked and went, I don't really understand what you mean. <laughs> but I think what he meant there is they've got experience, but they are a developing team. Mm. I think the best thing, whatever South Africa do in the pool, is just have a real, really positive experience with sort of good quality hockey played, whatever the results, so that they actually show how good a hockey playing country they are, exactly as they did in the Pro League um, for the men this year. I think for the women to kind of mirror that would be would be superb. Yeah. I mean, Jana, um, I know Germany spends a lot of time training out in South Africa, so you'll know the South African set up well. Mm -hmm. um, for, for me, I always really enjoy watching them. I always end up being disappointed in how they finish uh, because I always think that they're worth more. Their men went out in Tokyo and played some fantastic hockey and, and won a lot of plaudits. Can the women do it this time, do you think? I think it would be hard. It's as as you said, like they've got the potential and they've got you know they they could really build something there. But then they, they've probably of all those teams, they probably have the least funding. They you know they don't have the setup to get together a lot because it's great for them to play in, in Europe. And I think that's a smart way of training your players to you know put them in the European leagues because they're exposed to competition, a high level of competition every every other weekend. Um, but then it's hard to get everyone together because it's a 13 hour flight. So it's kind of that in between, you know, I want them to develop as individuals, but also I want to have time as a team, but also that costs a lot of money to be together. So it's kind of that yeah. challenge they always have. And it's a, uh, it would be interesting to see what they'd be like if they had the same funding as, you know, the top nations have. And actually Germany's is not even the best, right? There are other ones who've got massive, uh, like amazing setups. So, yeah, I think I would love to see it because like you, I enjoy seeing them. I feel like there might be the ones 
missing out in this squad. But again, depends on what what would Japan be like. Like Dan said, like they 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 sometimes struggle. They're really good. They're really skillful, but they struggle to really like bring it home mm. um, because they're too nice. Maybe in a way, I, I lived in Japan and they're just like the loveliest people. But it's just in the end that ruthlessness to actually win games. Um, and then obviously Belgium, they 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 on a you know they're on a strike. They they're doing really well. They've made massive progress in the in the last weeks uh, last weeks last last weeks but also the years you can see like how they they're following the men as well and australia is again the unknown one right they no one's seen them for a while but they've got that experience and um that the way of playing is just yeah very very entertaining as well actually to watch australia so interesting group but also that group by the way is that one where if you're not first they have to travel to holland to play across the of quarterfinals and if they win they have to travel again so they are the ones of all the teams that might have to travel twice and that would be interesting to see how that how does that play play in at some point as well does it make you more exhausted or is that change of scenery maybe you know energizing so it, that's an interesting factor as well to have a look at yeah what are your thoughts on that jill i mean if if belgium were to come second in that pool how would that impact them would, would they in as a team would they enjoy with the getting together at the airport and getting themselves, you know, what, what, how, how would they, how would they approach it? No, I, I think also Holland is closer to home. So <laughs> regarding traveling uh, supporters for us, it's like, I don't think, you know, it's easier to stay in your hotel and in your bubble and you have your habits and, uh, you know, you, you know, you would say not disagree. You have your habits and it's cool. And, and, but if they have to, they have to. And, and I think what the new generation brought to, 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 to that Belgium team is that, they don't care about details. They just want to play. They feel less pressure. Um, if they have to travel, they travel, and it's going to be fun. And you know, they take it more light, lightly, and as it should. Uh, really, it's like there. You know, you cannot lose energy on stuff you cannot control. And and then we can discuss in a few months if it was a good idea to have the World Cup in two different countries. Mm. Um, but as a player, I think you have to adapt, and that's a part of being a, a top athlete. There are stuff you cannot fight, you cannot waste too much energy on. And if we have to get, well, we, as I, if I played, but if they have to travel and get closer to home, I hope there's still going to be tickets because it's easier to to travel to Amsterdam than to Barcelona on a weekend. But, um, and especially if they play the last bit. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting on how they manage, the other team manage that, like, for example, Australia, if they have to travel yeah. again. But um, in the end, it's what it is and everyone knows the rules, so. Is that the biggest difference in the Belgium side in recent years? Is that resilience, uh, you know, this sort of this attitude of let's just get on and do it again, perhaps following a little bit in the men's footsteps in that respect? Yeah, but I think also like we can say about anything about generation or players coming up. It, it, we just needed time and time that we got recently time to prepare to get where, we're, where we wanted to be. And we started the program in 2000, 2012, 13 really after the qualifying by surprise for the Olympics. And, um, and we, have, we had for sure ups and downs, but every down led to something else, to a change of staff, to a change of uh, putting money where it should go and uh, helping the players. And I think we need, well, that team just needed time. And there's a generation coming that didn't know the struggles, that never lost a big tournament, that are on the winning strike and, like I said, you know, taking things more lightly and, and playing more freely. And I hope it will stay like this, this tournament, that they will not get or feel the pressure all of a sudden because they, they have been playing pressure free for the last year, I would say. Mm. And, you know, I think you were right. Like they, 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 made, they made a lot of progress the last weeks. Uh, also in game after game, there was something new, something different. And, and um, so it's going to be interesting on how they... They approach the tournament, and I hope they they will approach it like freely as they did uh, in the last uh, in the last weeks. Brilliant. Well, on this call, we know quite well that amongst the teams that you are all um, pushing and, and and supporting are Germany, um, Argentina, Belgium, and obviously the Netherlands are in that mix too. Who is going to do an Ireland? This is my final question to you. Who is mm -hmm. going to be the huge disruptor who just throws the whole thing off kilter? <clears throat> Jana, who's it going to be? Is it going to be Chile? Is it going to be Canada? Who do you reckon? No, I think I think it would be um, India, even though that might not be that big of a surprise. But it is in in the end to like to medal at the World Cup and um, India or actually Belgium. So I think they are the two ones to, to watch. Right, heard it here first. Belgium, India, Chile. Who are your disruptors? Uh, I hope Belgium and and then 
other teams like Spain or you cannot call them uh, disruptors. They are already like there to, to to finish in top four. But yeah, I hope Belgium and uh, yeah, I would say India too. Okay, Dan, anyone different? Just before I get locked in the coffee shop. Uh, no, I, I I think that's the beautiful, brilliant, super thing about how the sports developed since the last World Cup is, as you've all said, Belgium, India, Spain are no longer surprise packages. Uh, in fact, we've barely spoken about Ireland. I, I don't think they're quite in the same ilk as those three teams we've just spoken about. Um, on my wall chart, I just about had Spain sneak in the top four, but that could easily be replaced by Belgium or India very much, dependent on the day. German. Again, England England go and beat the odd team. They could make up. They're, they're, I don't think there's a surprise package like that because I don't see Chile or Canada or someone like that doing what Ireland did so fantastically and what Spain did at the last World Cup. But those three or four teams sort of just below the top two could be anywhere at the end of the uh, 17 days. Did you see them last time round? Did you see Ireland doing it last time round? You did. <laughs> OK. Oh, this, sorry, Brilliant. Sorry, 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 sorry. Did I think they were going to do it? No. No, I thought I thought <laughs> India would make top four at the Olympics. I didn't think Ireland would make final. Sorry, no, I can't claim that one. No. <laughs> Brilliant. OK. Experts' opinions all round, though. Uh, thank you so much for giving us your time. I know you all have to shoot off. Thank you so much indeed. Um, and hopefully I'll speak to at least two of the three of you before uh, before the end of this World Cup. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.